All right, so grab your Bibles, open them up, or turn them on to Mark chapter 2. Some of you know what I mean by turn them on. If you don't know what I mean by turn it on, um, download the app, man, the Bible app. It'll help you. No matter where you go, you got the Word of God with you. Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1, one of my favorite stories about Jesus that I want us to dive into today. It says this, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So they gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he began to preach the word to them. Some men came, bringing him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. So four guys were carrying this man. And since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then they lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Then down in verse 10, it says, Jesus goes on to say, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. The man got up, took his mat, walked out in the full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, say it with me out loud at all of our locations, we have never seen anything like this. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there that day? I mean, seriously, wouldn't you have loved to have been right in that room? With Jesus and all these people, and you're like hearing Jesus preach, and then all of a sudden you look up, and parts of the ceiling are like falling on people's heads, and like, what is going on? And then these four little heads poke through the hole, and they're like, hey, we got somebody for you, Jesus. And this man gets lowered down. Jesus speaks to him. He gets healed. He picks up his mat, and he walks out. He's like, see ya. We've never seen anything like this before. Listen, through our miracle series, we've been saying that if we're going to see things that we've never seen before, then we're going to have to do some things that we've never done before. We got to have faith to rip off the roof. We got faith to do things we've never done before. We gotta, if we're going to reach people in our cities and see them get healed and see them restored and whole in Christ, then we're going to have to try some things we've never tried before. We're going to have to go some places that we have never gone before. See, to reach people that nobody else is reaching, you got to do some things that nobody else is doing. we got to reach people. And here's what I know. When, when we get people to Jesus, he always gives them more than they bargain for. He always gives us more than we bargain for. Because that guy, the, the friends just lowered the man down through the roof to get him physically healed. But Jesus goes, I'm going to even do greater than that. I'm going to heal him from the inside out. I'm going to heal his soul. I'm going to make his soul whole. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to heal him spiritually as well as physically. And how many of you know that's the greatest miracle that takes place in this story? The outward thing that we can see is that this crippled man who couldn't walk, all of a sudden he was paralyzed. He's walking around. He's probably running and dancing. We see that. But what is unseen is more important than what is seen. What is unseen is eternal. What is unseen is this restoration of that man's soul back to God. And that miracle is the greatest miracle of all. And that miracle is available for every one of us. You know, I read this story. The first thing that jumps out to me is the crowd. The place was so packed out. It made me wonder, how did all those people hear that Jesus was there? How? how how did they know that he was in the house? It's not a trick question. <laughs> Somebody told them. Somebody had to tell them. Somebody had to get the word out that Jesus is here and you need to come see what he's doing because he is, he's doing some amazing things. He's got everything that you're looking for. Somebody had to invite every person that was there that day. Church, I want there to be such a spirit of invitation on this house that we don't wait for us to give you a Easter invite or a Christmas invite before you invite somebody. But man, you're just looking around at the people at your work and the lady at the restaurant and the person over here, you're just like, hey, you need to come to church with Jesus is in town. He's in the house because Jesus is here more than just Easter and Christmas, thank God. You know what I'm saying? We gotta help people. We, we, we don't need to keep Jesus a secret. We gotta get the word. Have you ever tried to keep a secret? And you just, you've got this secret inside, you just can't wait to tell somebody, right? When I, the night I asked Julie to marry me, um, I had gone to the store, bought a ring, scheduled dinner, picked her up from work. We weren't even dating at the time. Because that's how I roll. That's just how I, that's how, I, that's how I do things, you know what I'm saying? So I pick her up, I'm like, hey, and get in the car, we go to dinner. I've got this ring in my pocket, and it is like burning a hole in my, she has no idea. We weren't even dating, we weren't holding hands, we weren't even, hey, she, I've got this ring, I cannot wait to pull this ring out. And t- all my, dinner took forever, 
And I knew that wasn't the right place. Then we went walking down over on Palm Beach. I'm like, here, there, no, here, I've had to find the right place. Burning a hole. I could not wait to get that ring out of my pocket and kneel down and show her and tell her that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her. Some of you need to pull Jesus out of your pocket and show him to the people in your world. They're waiting, they're dying to know what you know, to know who you know, and you know the one that can set them free. Don't keep Jesus a secret. Notice in verse five, it says there that when Jesus saw their faith, when they lowered the man down, it says when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now notice it says there, Jesus saw whose faith? Their faith. It doesn't say Jesus saw the man's faith. It says that Jesus saw their faith, which tells me that the friend's faith, the faith that the friends had is actually what carried the man to Jesus. Their faith brought healing. Their faith brought life. Their faith actually ended up bringing salvation, which scripturally tells us there, there, our faith, can, we can actually believe for people on this journey of them not knowing what to believe for themselves. We, we can help, we can have faith. Our faith will carry them to Jesus, but we gotta get them to Jesus. We gotta get them in the presence of Jesus because that crippled man was not gonna be healed laying on his mat in his own house. He had to get to the house where God was. He had to get into the presence of Jesus. So my question for you is, who are you carrying to Jesus? Who is it right now in this season that is, God has spiritually kind of put them on your heart and you are you carrying their spiritual burden for them because they're lost and they don't know Christ and so you're gonna carry them in prayer and you're gonna carry them by the words you say to them and you're gonna carry them by inviting them and trying to get them to a place and looking for those opportunities and conversations where you get to speak the words of life over them. You're gonna set time aside. You're gonna set your agenda aside. You're gonna be inconvenienced for them to carry them into the presence of Jesus. When Julie was a teenager, um, her parents didn't attend uh, our church or much of any church, but there was a youth worker, a volunteer in our youth ministry where Julie and I were, were attending, and her name was Carrie. And Carrie would go every day on every Wednesday and every Sunday to pick Julie up. And the significance of that was that Julie lived out in west, west, west Jupiter before the roads were paved. So it was like 30 minute drive, most of which on dirt, sandy roads. And Carrie didn't have a good car. (laughs) And Carrie would drive 30 minutes each way to pick Julie up to carry her to Jesus. This is back when Julie was trying to figure out Jesus. She was trying to figure out this whole God thing. She was trying to figure this out. She didn't, she was the only kid in the youth group whose parents did not attend the church. Oh, so it took a lot for her to come, but, but every week, every Wednesday, every Sunday, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, Carrie would carry, would carry, I just figured out her name was Carrie, and she carried Julie to <laughs> Jesus. She was a part of taking Julie to Jesus, and, and Jesus touched Julie's life and changed Julie's life and made her soul whole. Who are you carrying to Jesus? See, the reason this man was changed is because somebody carried him to Jesus. And here's what I know, there are people all around us that are paralyzed spiritually and paralyzed emotionally. They've been paralyzed by the pain of their past. Somebody has dropped them. Someone has let them down and hurt them and it has stunted their life. And somebody's got to pick them up and carry them to Jesus and that somebody has to be us. So Jesus says to this this guy, first lower down, your sins are forgiven. And if you read the text there, it says that some of the religious people in the room got all upset that Jesus said that. Like who, do, who does he think, they're all thinking this, who does he think he is to forgive sins? Nobody can forgive sins. And, and it's amazing to me how religious people get so constipated so easily. <laughs> oh, 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 we've never done it that way. We never did that in our old church that way. We never, I don't know if I agree with that style of worship, everybody hopping around. And why is, why is that guy down front going, whoa, I don't know. And I, whoa, 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 whoa. I, we didn't let women talk at our church. They weren't allowed to talk. I mean, we just crazy things. Religious people get so crazy. There's nothing life-giving about that. And Jesus could read their minds and he said he knew what they were thinking. It says in verse eight, he even said, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say this to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the son of man can do whatever the son of man wants to do. He has authority on earth and to forgive sins. So he said to the man, just to show everybody the greatest miracle that's already taken place, I tell you, take your mat and go home. And the man got up, took his mat, walked out in full view of them all. It amazed everybody. They started praising God. They started hollering. We've never seen anything like this. So if we're 
If we're gonna be able to say as a church and as individuals, we've never seen anything like this in our lives. We've never seen God do this in our community, in our region, in our, in our church. I see three things that we have to do in this story. Three things. Number one, you gotta pick up the mat. First thing you have to do is you gotta pick up the mat. And you may say, well, Todd, that doesn't sound very spiritual. Doesn't sound very miraculous, very supernatural. It's not, it's very natural. But it often requires the natural to usher in the supernatural, right? We've been learning that in our miracle story. And the reason this is important for you is because you have to pick up your mat. You have to pick up the corner of your mat. The corner, there's a corner that's got your name on it. And it took all four of those guys to pick up this mat and carry this guy to Jesus. Not one of them could have dragged that poor guy to himself, with himself to Jesus. He would have been all beat up on the road with all the you know, rocks hitting his head. Two of them couldn't have done it. Three of them couldn't have got up on top of the roof and lowered him down. It took all of them doing that. And I want you to know what you have to do is important. It's significant in the body of Christ. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. All of us together are the one body of Christ. And each of you is a separate, and what's that word? Necessary part of it. You, I want you to, if you get nothing else today, I want you to understand you are a necessary, which means needed, vital, important part of the body of Christ. You are a critical member of this body, of this church, of this, of this team. We're a team. Anybody been watching uh, the NBA playoffs last week or so? Come on. I know the Heat aren't in it, and LeBron is, <laughs> right? So all us South Florida people, we got a little problem we got to deal with on that issue. But let me just tell you, LeBron has been playing some ball, right? I mean, the Cavaliers, moment of silence for all the Boston Celtics fans <laughs> among us. That was bad, right? But LeBron could not have won alone. He might have thinks he could have won alone, but he couldn't have won alone. He, there's no way he could have, he, he needed the, his whole team to play with him. All of them were a necessary part of this. Irving and Love, he needed all of them to be able to, he needed the coaches and the trainers and the water boys and the ball boys, everybody on the team so that they could win. Now they're probably not gonna win the next round, but that's okay, we won't worry about that right now. <laughs> but what I want you to see in this passage is that Paul says each of you are an important part of it. And he goes on to say in that passage that even the unseen body parts are really the most necessary body parts, the more important ones. Think about what happens when one of your body parts stops functioning the way it's supposed to. Your elbow freezes up, your knee, free, your back, your, you, know, your, you wake up with a kink in your neck. You know, have you ever done that? You can function, but you're not gonna thrive that day. I'm just telling you, you're gonna be walking around like this, people calling your name, you know what I'm saying? See, that's the way the body of Christ is when you're not functioning the way you're called to function within the body. We can, we can make it, but we're not gonna thrive. We're not gonna be everything God has called us to be without you being who you're supposed to be in the body of Christ. You gotta function in this body. See, what makes Christ Fellowship a great church is not the pastors or the worship or the music or the staff. What makes Christ Fellowship a great church is the thousands and thousands of people that serve Jesus through his church every day of the week. Not just on the weekends, but all, all week long. You, you the, what we call the dream team. And we call you the dream team because you're making the dream, the vision that God has given us for this region, you're making that a reality in people's lives and hearts. You're helping people that are far from God find God. It's the people that get up before the sun comes up on Sunday morning to turn the Harriet down in City Place into a house of worship and then stay there all day and serve and then at night put it all back in carts and move it back in. It's the band driving out, volunteer band driving out to Okeechobee at five o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning. They got to love Jesus to do that, I'm telling you. They got to believe some big things for Okeechobee to do that. It's all the children's workers, hundreds and thousands of children's workers that serve and, and make a place so that parents can come and drop their kids off in a place they wanna be so that the parents can come in and hear the message of Christ and, and turn their lives around and become the husbands and the wives and the moms and the dads that they're created to be. It's every, per every parking lot attendant, every greeter, every person holding the door, every person smiling, that every one of you doing what God has called you to do. The Bible says you are a necessary, important part of it. You know, I've heard, 
I've heard two misconceptions whenever I talk to people about whether or not they're getting involved and serving in church. And the first one is this. The first is I hear people say, well, Christ Fellowship is so big, you don't need me. (laughs) Wrong answer. Our vision is so big. Our mission is so big. Our dreams for this region are so big that we would see a radical transformation that we cannot do it without you. You are a vital, necessary part of everything God's calling us to be and to do as a church. In fact, our mission statement, I think that I gave it to you guys. Put this up on the screen. Let's say this together out loud. We are called to impact our world with the love and the message of Jesus Christ. Say it, everyone, every day, everywhere. You are in everyone. The church is not a building. It's not an organization. You are the church. You're the everyone part of that. And so we have to go be everyone every day, everywhere, being the church, making a difference for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. See, we have kids that are coming into our church, teenagers, that are not coming from a godly home. They have no godliness being spoken over their life. They have no understanding of God and his word. And so God is calling some of you to step up and be spiritual coaches and mentors to these kids that will change the direction of their life and change a generation. You can do that. And if you would say, well, Todd, I don't even know. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can do that, actually. I'm just kind of a new Christian myself. Okay, well, then you can come and set out the food and check the kids in and help get the bathrooms clean because they make a mess in the bathroom. You, you can help us change a generation and make a difference in kids' lives. I, I want everybody that calls Christ Fellowship their home. I want you plugged in. I want you serving. I want you doing your part. Listen, we are not a cruise ship on holiday, we are a battleship on mission. We got a purpose and a mission that is given to us by God. So you are an important part of that. The second misconception I hear all the time is I don't really have anything significant to bring to the table. I really can't, I really can't do much. And when I look around, you guys, looks like you got it going on. Like everything looks so good. So I, I don't know if I can play in that game. Hey, listen, let me let me in on a secret. If it looks like it's going on, If it looks like we got it all together, it's only because of the thousands of people that are serving every day, serving using their gifts and their talents and their ability because it's really about Jesus has it going on, amen? Amen. I got an email this week from a lady uh, and she says that she was trying to break free from his addictions in her life and she was down here in a treatment center and someone told her that she needed to have God in her her life so uh, she needed to get a relationship with God so they told her to come to church and they told her to come to this church and she said that um, when she pulled in the church she was uh, alone and scared. She said, I quote, I was nervous because I thought I would be judged for being a drug addict but from the moment I pulled in the parking lot I felt welcomed and loved. I want you to know that before a word was spoken to her from this platform, the message had already gone out. She had already felt love. People were already loving on her, welcoming her. She's like, oh, wow, I actually belong here. Wow, these people actually, they actually love me. In fact, I've had people tell me all week long that the only time that they ever get a hug or they ever have somebody tell them that they love them is when they're here at church on the weekend. Now that's, I'm glad they're getting it here. It's sad this is the only place they're getting it, but how important is it that you're giving somebody a hug? How important is it you're saying, hey, we love you. We are glad you're here. You are loved by God. You, you know, sometimes the little things are really the big things. We think it's so little. Man, it's not little, it's big. It's a big thing in someone's life and heart to know they are loved and welcomed. And that's why Allison Yuri up at our Stewart campus, she is known for helping other students feel welcomed in the student ministry. And she's just a student herself. I love that, Allison. I'm so proud of you. Um, I had Stephen Stone. I had someone tell me about you. Stephen is our Royal Palm Usher captain. And there's a family, uh, Darlene and Don, husband and wife. They hadn't been in church had come into this big church out at Royal Palm. They didn't know what to think. And they said, every time they see Stephen back there, Stephen gives them a hug. Stephen loves on him. Stephen, you've made it home for them. I love that our dream team is making it happen. You know, they say that somebody makes a decision to come to church within the first seven minutes of showing up. First seven minutes. So if they don't come back, it ain't my fault. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> But what I love is the reason they keep coming back is because you all are loving on them. Would you give it up one more time for all the dream team serving and loving? Might just be a smile. Might just be 
coming in and setting a room up so a kid can learn about Jesus. Might just be, you know, we got Belle Glade coming up with over 900 kids going out to Belle Glade. And we still need some Belle Glade day volunteers to go out and love on the kids, make the lunches, serve the meals, make sure they have enough water. You don't have to sleep out there. You can go home and sleep in your own bed. But you could give a day or two to invest in the lives of these students, help them get their hearts set on Jesus through the summer and become who God's called them to be. If you want to see God do these things that we've never seen him do, if we want to see this, the first thing is you got to pick up the corner of your mat. The second thing is you got to push through the mess. you got to pick up the mat. you got to push through the mess. These four guys didn't let anything stop them. They could have thought, well, you know what? It's too crowded. Sorry, Joe. You know, we'll get you. Next time Jesus comes, we'll, we'll do a little better. We can't. This ain't going to work, right? But they weren't looking for excuses. They were looking for Jesus. How many of you know they, they pushed through? They had to push through the mess. They were ripping off the, the roof. What if one of them had said, no, nah, I don't want to do that. You know, this is taking about an hour. I'm, I'm done. My time here is, I'm, I'm good, good. What if a couple, they wouldn't have been able to do what they were called. They all had to push through. I heard someone say this week that the faith to step out is useless without the faithfulness to stick it out. The faith to step out is useless without the faithfulness to stick it out. We gotta stick it out. We gotta people that push through the mess. Because here's what I know. When you decide to serve Jesus by serving people, you're gonna face some obstacles. You're gonna deal with some opposition, right? You're gonna, there's gonna be lots of reasons for you not to follow through on serving. Because these guys all had valid reasons. Because when you serve people, it gets messy. Because people are messy. People got problems. People got attitude, you know what I'm saying? And, and you, may, you may start serving at church and just go, well, that was rude. <laughs> Can't believe people at church would treat me. <laughs> right? Hey, we're all people. Sometimes you're rude. Sometimes I'm rude. We're all people. We're in process. We're letting God do his work in us. We're going to push through the mess. We're not going to let anything keep us from helping get people to Jesus. Amen. We're going to make it easy for people to find Christ. And I want you to know something. Back in the day, when these men climbed up on the roof and tore it apart, the houses were made out of a mixture of mud and manure. Yeah. So when they were digging through the roof, they were digging through the manure. And I started to think about sometimes you're gonna have to dig through some, hmm, to get people to Jesus. You know what I'm saying? You're gonna have to dig, you're gonna have to put up with some, hmm, some manure, I'm keeping it clean, keep manure to get people to Jesus because what they're in right now, it stinks. Man, what they got themselves into, they're in deep. And they actually need someone to wade in with them and help them get out of where they are. And if we're not, if we're so concerned about it being inconvenienced, if we're so concerned about going, well, I don't want to get into that. That just seems, ah, oh, I didn't know if I'd be a, a life group host that I'd actually have to deal with that. Yeah, you're going to have to deal with that because people are dealing with that. That's who we are. But we're going to jump into the middle of the mess. We're going to press through the mess to help people get the healing and the wholeness that Jesus has for them. Amen? See, we don't just want to bring people to Jesus We have to bring people to Jesus because we know he is the only one that can make them whole. He is the only one that can save them. He's the only one that can put their lives back together again. That's why I love this weekend that we're honoring uh, all of you on the dream team because you're, you're doing this. You're picking up the corner of your mat and you're carrying people to Jesus. You're, you know, you're, you're serving, you're loving. I think about, um, there's a lady named Dottie out in our Boynton Beach campus and she's in her seventies and she works in the nursery. And I want you to know, Dottie, I got emails this week telling me about how you have changed the lives of families because you've been loving on their kids and the parents are going to church and they're going to journey. They're getting in marriage classes. Their lives are being changed because of you, Dottie. We love you. There's a guy up in, uh, up in Stewart and his name is Guy. He's a, uh, a Vietnam veteran in his 70s. And Guy, you sit up and you tear down and you did that in the school and now you're ushering. And I heard about the family that the only reason they're coming to Christ Fellowship and they decided to come back was because of the way you love them. It is the little things that are the big things that set up the big thing that God wants to do in people's lives. And we get to be a part of the big things. Jesus put it this way. He said this, your attitude must be like my own. This is Matthew 20. Your attitude must be like my very own. For I did not come to be served, say it with me, but to serve and to give my life. And notice it says there, your attitude must be like me. This is an optional. Serving and giving 
is not optional for a Christ follower. A non-serving Christian is an oxymoron. A non-serving Christian is a contradiction. I cannot call myself a follower of Jesus and not be serving and giving. God would look at that and go, no, you're not. You gotta be like Jesus. You gotta do what Jesus would do. And Jesus lived to give. And we got that core value, live to give, which is so much more than just about financial. It's about saying, Lord, everything that I am, I wanna be a steward of my time, of my talents and abilities, and of my resources. For I wanna steward myself for eternity for the things that matter most. So Lord, everything. First Peter 4.10 says this, God has given gifts to each of you from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Manage them well so that God's generosity can flow through you. Here's what I can tell you. When you live to give, when you serve others, God's generosity, his grace flows through your life and you are pushing through the mess, you're picking up the corner of your mat and that gets us to the last thing that I see here. You have to expect the unexpected. You have to expect, if you're gonna experience the miraculous, you've gotta expect the miraculous. And we just came out of a whole series on that so I'm not gonna stay here very long but I want you to know the only reason Those men ripped the roof off was because they know, they knew Jesus had what their friend needed. That's the only reason they ripped the roof off. I wonder what the owner was thinking of the house. Have you ever thought that? He's down there going, what is going on? Jesus comes in and everything gets ripped up. Yeah, he he does that. When you bring Jesus into your life, there's some things that get ripped up. He, he, He dismantles some things. He works on some things. There's some things he wants to expose and he's gonna rip it apart. He's gonna work on it, but it's for your good. And so these guys, they knew If they could just get their friend to the miracle worker, their friend would experience their miracle. And God used them to get their friend to Jesus. God used them to usher in the supernatural into the natural. And in the very same way, I believe with all my heart that God wants to use you to usher the supernatural into the natural. Serving is not about meaningless tasks. It's about the miraculous. It's about making way for the miraculous in people's lives. I I wish I had time to tell you the full story about Erica. When we started our Boynton Beach campus years ago, Erica went down there to start just helping to serve and she didn't know how, actually been coming to Christ Fellowship for a while, but she had never stepped up to be a part of our dream team. So she jumped in and they said, she said, where do you need me? And they said, if you go down to students, that'd be great. So she went down there. She didn't think she had anything to offer. She said, I don't. I don't have anything to give. So she just came and set up and cleaned up and tore down. That's all she did. And one day, God told her to buy a minivan. And she said, God, I don't need a minivan. I'm a single. I don't need a minivan. God said, buy a minivan. kept telling her, buy a minivan, buy a minivan. So she went out and she bought a used minivan. Side note, the next week, after she bought that minivan, her mortgage company contacted her and said, we are low, we've been overcharging you. We're gonna lower your mortgage payments by the, it ended up being the exact amount that she had to spend to get this minivan, right? Now, so she had this minivan. She's like, Lord, why do I have this minivan? All of a sudden, all these kids in the housing complex where she was, the apartment complex, just started hanging out. So she's like oh, inviting them to church. They all started coming to church with her. She needed the minivan to drive them to church. And you know what? They got saved. They gave their life to Jesus. They're growing in the word all because she thought, I don't think this is much, but when she began to go, God, I'm gonna expect that you're gonna use me for the miraculous. I'm gonna begin to let you use me any way you want me, use me. God will take what we've got. Even if it's just, I'm just gonna buy a minivan. I'm gonna drive kids. I'll do whatever, God, you want me to do. See, when you do what you can do, God will do what only God can do. But we gotta do our part. We gotta pick up the corner of the mat. We gotta believe in faith for them what they don't know what to even believe for themselves. And here's what I know, we partner with Jesus, we see lives change, we see people who've been paralyzed from their past, walking in the power and the freedom that God wants to give them. So you may be thinking, okay, Todd, what do you need me to do? Want me to work in the parking lot? Okay, I'll sweat for Jesus. (laughs) Want me to work in the nursery, change diapers? I didn't even like to change my own kids' diapers. You want me to paint a, a building on four Saturday serve? You know, paint a house? I mean, my own house needs painting, but okay. Now, I want you to hear this. I don't need you to work in the parking lot. I don't, I don't need you to work in the children's rooms. I don't, I, we don't need you to paint buildings. That's not what this is about. This is about a mission that we are on together. This is about a call that is from God, something that is so much bigger than any one of us. It's about us rescuing teenagers that, that 
that don't even know that God exists and helping them walk under the authority of God's word and experience the blessing and the life that God has for them. It's about families that are torn apart and, and wrecked by divorce and we're gonna step in and the church family, God's family is gonna make up for what's missing in their family and God's gonna use you to be a spiritual uncle or aunt that's gonna bless them and help them and call up the God thing in them. You're gonna step in where maybe some physical family stepped out and God's gonna use you. He's gonna use us together to bring light in this region like never before. It is a mission of God that we are on. It is not minuscule, it is miraculous. And we get to be a part of it. You get to be a part of it. So my challenge to you is this. What do you need to do to pick up your corner of the mat and be a part of the God story that he is unfolding over this region? See, God is doing something that is way bigger than any of us at Christ Fellowship. I mean, I'm here to tell you, this is so far above our ability or our strategy. It is, an, it is a work of God, and we get to be a part of it. So what do you need to do to pick up your corner of the mat to be a part of the move of God in this region? Don't miss out on it. Will it be some inconvenience of time and energy? And Yeah, it will. But the payback is unbelievable because think about these four guys. They got to see the miraculous. They got to see their friend who had been paralyzed raised to new life. They got to see Jesus do, they got an upfront, close, personal experience to the miraculous. And so do we when we do this. What do you need to do? If you're serving somewhere right now, man, I just keep serving. Look for places to use the gifts God's given you. If you're not, man, I encourage you to jump in. I'm challenging you. If this is your church home and you don't serve or give, it's really not your church. It's your show. You know, bring popcorn next time. We need you to jump in. We don't have any more spectator seats available. I'm just saying, okay? And that was a golf clap there. It was like, <laughs> we, we got a lot of work to do. We want you to jump. You know, if you have not gone through the journey yet, I just want to ask you, why not? How, how, many, how many years? How many years do you have to hear me say? Go to the journey. Get plugged into the journey. Just go to the journey. It starts next week at all of our campuses. Just, and you're like, well, I don't know if I'm home the whole month of June. That's okay. Get pointed in the right direction. You can make up a class if you're going to be gone. We will work with you. We just want to help you experience the call of God that's on your life so that we together can be what God is calling us to be on the earth in Jesus' name. Amen? I want the campus teams to come at all of our campuses and um, we're going to stand together, ask uh, at this time of prayer. Nobody leave as we just pray. See, everything that I talked about today is about us helping people discover who they've been created to be. It's about helping people walk in the newness of life that God has for them. It's about having a fresh start and, and, and just helping other people discover that. But you can't give away if you don't have it. You can't give away something you don't possess. And so I just want to have two prayers as we close today. Our teams are going to pray, first of all, that we as a church would step into everything God has for us and that you would step up and pick the corner of your mat and be who God's called you to be. But I also want to pray for those of you here today that, that you need that new life and you need that new beginning with Jesus. You can have it by just opening up your heart to him today. Would you bow with me as we pray? God, I thank you for uh, that your word challenges us to get uncomfortable. It challenges us to step out of our comfort zone into our calling, into our purpose. And even taking little steps in the right direction, God, will get us to where we need to go. And I just pray that we as a church, as we're stepping out in this season, um, Lord, I think about just here at the Gardens campus launching the Jupiter campus, it's gonna create a lot of open spots for people to step up and serve. I pray that, God, you would put on people's hearts even today to step up and be who you called them to be, to be a part of your church and a part of what you're doing on the earth today. And I pray that we as a church, God, would not miss one thing that you have for us. With every head bowed, if you're here today and you would say, Todd, when you talked about that new life and that, that hope and that new beginning, I don't know that I have that, but I need that. When you talked about a relationship with Jesus, I don't know that I've ever had a relationship with Jesus. Or if I did, I know today it's not where it needs to be. I wanna lead you in a prayer. And this prayer will just help that relationship with God begin or get back to where it needs to be so that you can experience the hope, that freedom that Jesus came to give you. And if you would say, Todd, would you include me in that prayer that you're getting ready to pray? Right where you are, would you just slip your hand up in the air and say, Todd, include me in that prayer. Yeah, hold him up high all across the room. Yeah, even in the back, hold him up high. We're gonna pray this prayer. And those of you with your hands up, this prayer is your prayer. You pray it, you pray it loud. Just pray this, say, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me just the way I am. Today, I declare 
that I need you in my life. Forgive me of my sin and make me a new person from the inside out. And I will follow you the best I know how for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Church, let's thank God for those who made that decision today. Listen, as you leave, we have a Bible for you. And uh, all of our usher teams have this Bible. Our prayer teams are here to pray with you. Guys, this is gonna be a great season that we're stepping into as a church. I want you to know I love you. I'm excited about what God's doing. Have a blessed week in Jesus' name. Happy Memorial Day.